It's a time when Rahula went to the Buddha. He was probably a teenager at the time, and asked him how to do breath meditation. And the Buddha didn't start out immediately with instructions on breath meditation. He taught Rahula a whole set of other practices to go first. The most striking one is the one about making your mind like earth, making your mind like water, like wind, like fire. How is it like earth? He said, well, if you throw disgusting things on the earth, the earth doesn't shrink away. And the same principle applies to the other elements. You use water to wash away disgusting things, and it doesn't get disgusted. The wind blows disgusting things around, but it isn't disgusted. Fire burns disgusting things, and it doesn't get disgusted. It just keeps on doing its duty. He said in the same way, when you meet up with pleasing and unpleasing things, you should make your mind non-reactive. Lessons in how to just accept things the way they are. But he doesn't stop there. When you look at the instructions on breath meditation, they're very proactive. So the equanimity is there to serve a purpose. So you can watch things carefully, watch things consistently. You say, gee, I don't like this, I don't like that. You're never going to learn anything. You have to be willing to sit with good things, sit with bad things. So you can see them, so you can understand them. Only when you understand them can you really free yourselves from them. This is the attitude we adopt at the beginning. So we're going to put up with everything that comes in the course of our meditation. Not just to sit there like a bump on a log, but so you can understand where things come from and where they lead. When feelings arise, whether they're pleasant or painful, you want to understand where they come from. You also want to understand the impact they have on the mind. But then the Buddha doesn't have you just sit there with feelings, whatever comes up. Of course, the breath meditation. He tells you to try to breathe in a way that gives rise to feelings of rapture, breathe in a way that gives rise to feelings of pleasure. And the instructions on feelings in the Mahasattva Sutta. So you want to be aware of feelings of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And then he divides those three into two, each of them into two types. There's pleasure of the flesh, and there's pleasure not of the flesh. There's pain of the flesh, pain not of the flesh. Feelings of neither pleasure nor pain of the flesh and not of the flesh. And those not of the flesh feelings don't just happen on their own. You have to will them into being. You have to be skillful in giving rise to them, otherwise they don't happen. Pleasure not of the flesh is the pleasure that comes from jhana. That doesn't just happen. You have to direct your thoughts, you have to evaluate things. There's work that has to be done to get the mind into jhana. It's a fabrication. Pain not of the flesh is also th something you have to give rise to. When things aren't going well in life, you remind yourself okay, how much you really do want to attain the goal of total freedom from suffering. The problem is, of course, you're not there yet. And how many times I've heard people say, well, don't desire the goal and you'll be okay. But the Buddha never recommended that. He said, this is a feeling you want to give rise to. This is a pain you want to give rise to because it gives you the motivation to dig deeper inside and find a better 
foundation for your happiness than just sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. So it's a healthy kind of pain. It's the pain that leads to gain. And then finally, there's the feeling of neither pleasure nor pain that is not of the flesh. That's the equanimity that comes from the practice of jhana. That's, that too is something you want to develop. Because as the Buddha said, there are basically two ways that you can undercut the causes of suffering and stress. One is through equanimity and the other is through what he calls the exertion of fabrication. Now equanimity comes in many levels. There's the ordinary equanimity that we learn how to just accept whatever comes up, like the Buddha taught Rahula in the beginning. Just learn to be non-reactive. But that kind of equanimity, the Buddha said, doesn't go very far. He tried to replace it with the equanimity that comes from jhana, in other words, equanimity not of the flesh. So even there, in the exercise of equanimity requires a certain amount of effort and a certain amount of fabrication. And there you use that equanimity to look at things. There are certain things when you look at them in the, in the mind, you say, gee, I really don't want to go there. I've seen that particular defilement. I've seen where it goes. I've seen what it does. I've had enough. And that's it. It just disappears. Or, as a John Lee said, it gets embarrassed. If you look at it steadily enough and forcefully enough, you can see right through it. However, there are other causes of stress and suffering that you can't see right through that way. They have a real pull on the mind. They have a real hold on the mind. And this is where you have to as I said, exert a fabrication, like we're doing right now, focusing on the breath, adjusting the breath. And there's verbal fabrication and the directed thought and evaluation as you direct your thoughts to the breath and you evaluate the breath. Bodily fabrication is the breath itself. The in and out breathing, because that's the process that fabricates your sense of the body. It's one of the few bodily processes that you can actually control. You can decide to breathe long, and you can decide to breathe short, heavy or light. It's not like your digestion. You can't tell your stomach to turn on or turn off. This is a process, however, that really does have an impact on how you experience the body. So you learn how to exercise that control, because otherwise emotions come in, they take over not only the mind but also the body, and the fact that they get enlarged in the body gives them a lot of power. You've got to learn how to undercut that power by breathing through them in a different way. So that covers verbal fabrication and bodily fabrication. The third kind of fabrication is mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. The feelings you create through the breath can help undercut the hold of certain hungers in the mind. And the perceptions you keep in mind can give you a new perspective on what's happening. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha included so many similes and so many images in his teachings, to give you a new range of similes and images to apply when you need to. For example, he has a whole lot of similes on sensuality. It's like a set of bones with no meat, a bead of honey on a blade of a knife. So the next time you see the honey of a sensual pleasure, well, think of it, okay, this is on a blade of a knife. You're going to cut your tongue if you try to lick it off. It's borrowed goods. You go around with all your cool things and all the cool people you can gather around you, but they're not really yours, especially the people with whom you find sensual pleasure. They can change their mind at any time. You don't own them. And if you're 
happiness is dependent on something you can't really control. It's really in a bad situation. You've got to learn how to keep those perceptions in mind to help wean yourself away from the defilements of lust or anger or greed. And bringing the mind the concentration requires perceptions as well. You have to have a certain perception of the breath, a certain perception of the body. At the very least, you have to have an image in your mind. Or a coded sensation that says, okay, this is your focal point. This is where you're going to stay, in order to remind yourself to stay here. That, too, is a mental fabrication. So there are lots of different ways you can use these fabrications in order to counteract those causes of stress and suffering that are really deeply entrenched. And you have to learn through your own experience which causes of suffering we respond to, which type of approach. We like the idea that just watch this and it's going to go away and that's the end of it. And we notice, okay, there are times when it actually happens, but it's not going to happen all the time. You need to have other approaches. And as I said, even equanimity itself is not something that just comes on its own easily. You have to cultivate it. You have to give it a more solid foundation. And then there's the problem of getting attached to the equanimity itself. We hear about enlightened people who are extremely equanimous. Well, that's it's not that. The equanimity is the essence of their attainment. After all, the Buddha didn't say nirvana is the ultimate equanimity, he said it's the ultimate happiness. But the fact that they have a basis for their happiness that doesn't depend on conditions, that allows them to look at conditioned reality with a lot more equanimity. They're not trying to feed on it anymore. They don't need it for their happiness. So the equanimity is a byproduct. I mean, there's a common problem when people meditate and they hear about enlightened people being like this or being like that, and so they try to clone what they hear about. But all you can clone are the effects, and if they're cloned, they're like Dolly the sheep, you know, they die quickly. You want to find the real foundation for that equanimity, which is something else entirely. The Buddha said this comes from term he calls non-fashioning. Or regardless of what comes up, you learn how not to identify yourself with it. You don't make it part of your self-definition. Then again, we hear, well, just decide that there's no self, and that's that. Well, the thing is, there are going to be subtle feelings of self, subtle feelings of identification that creep in when you're not aware. So rather than trying to deny them, you admit the fact that they're there. You try to notice where there's identification. And there's a certain amount of identification that's needed to get the path together. You have to have a healthy sense of self in order to do this. That means a self that's not always looking for shortcuts, or easy way out. And one of the problems with identifying the whole of the teaching as being equanimity or radical acceptance is that it teaches you to be lazy. It's an excuse for laziness. Even determinism can be an excuse for laziness. At one time, when I was trying to think about karma, I was new to the practice, and I saw John Fu one day said, you know, if everything in the present is conditioned by the past, that means there's no choice that I have to make right now whether I'm going to practice or not. It's just going to happen. It may seem like a choice, but it's not really a choice. He looked at me, and the look he gave me made me realize I should never think that way ever again. And I realized well, that was laziness speaking. Equanimity is there because it puts you in a position where you can see things more clearly, more consistently. You're a better judge of what works and what doesn't work in terms of your strategies on the path and the way you fabricate things. It's not an end in and of itself. It 
to learn how to use equanimity properly and use your attitudes around equanimity properly so that you can also handle the kind of fabrication that's needed, like putting the path together inside. And the good side of all this is that the Buddha gives you tools, so they're not just stuck there having to sit with whatever comes up or accept whatever comes up and be totally defenseless. There are ways you can handle difficult situations. There's ways you can handle difficult people. Whatever's really getting to you. It's not just that, hey, you just learn to, to accept it and that's it. The Buddha doesn't stop there. He says there's a way to figure out how to deal with this problem. It's going to require some patience and it's going to require some equanimity to see what that way is. But don't be afraid to use the tools that the Buddha gives you. Otherwise you're defenseless in the face not only of difficult situations, you're also defenseless in the face of your defilements, because they, they can take on the voice of Dharma themselves. You know, don't be desiring, don't have craving. Defilements can say that too. Don't desire to be rid of us. Let's learn to accept us. It's all a bunch of lies, but it sounds like Dharma. So realize that the Buddha gave you a wide range of tools to use in the path. And try to take advantage of them all. <laughs>